We have repeatedly stated that given knowledge of the gravitational parameter of our two body system, a simultaneous measurement of the position and velocity vector of one of the bodies with respect to the other is all that you need to fully describe the orbit for all time. And these two vectors together represent six scalar quantities. On the other hand, in our geometric description of orbits, we have been using many fewer quantities. In fact, we've only been using three, the semi-major axis of the orbit, the eccentricity of the orbit, and then some measure of the current time on the orbit. For example, the time since Periap's passage, or equivalently the true anomaly, or any one of the orbit-specific anomalies or the universal variable. So there's a disconnect here in that we have six scalar values versus only two or three scalar values, depending on how you think about it. And one possibility is that this is actually a non-linearly independent set of values, but that can't be the case because of the governing differential equation of the system. So there has to be something missing from our geometric picture of orbits. And what's missing is that these describe the orbit in a very specific reference frame, the parafocal frame, which is not at all arbitrary, whereas these can be used to describe the orbit in any arbitrary reference frame. And so the disconnect is that we have not provided ourselves with a method of figuring out the orientation of the parafocal frame in any arbitrary inertial frame. So let's do that now. By convention, the inertial to parafocal frame mapping is given by a 313 Euler angle set. Euler angles, as you may recall, are the applications of the simple direction cosine matrices representing rotations about a single body fixed axis. The 313 here denotes that we will be rotating about the third axis and then the first new axis of the intermediate frame and then the third axis of the second intermediate frame to get to our final parafocal frame. And the Greek letters represent the angles assigned to each of these rotations. So we start with an capital omega, which is the longitude of the ascending node, rotation about our inertial E3 axis. And this E3 axis can be anything. The E1, E2, E3 describe any arbitrary frame. This takes our first unit axis of our initial frame into the n hat direction, which is called the line of nodes. After this, we take a i rotation, i for inclination, about the first new unit direction, which is n hat. And that brings us to the second intermediate frame. And that takes the original E3 direction into the angular momentum direction of the orbit. So this is the direction orthogonal to the parafocal plane. And finally, we take a third lowercase omega rotation about the angular momentum direction, and that rotates the line of nodes into the eccentricity vector direction. And we have our q hat direction completing the vector triad. Omega is called the argument of periapsis because the eccentricity direction is the periapsis direction, and this is the angle between the original plane E1, E2, and the eccentricity direction. We can further help visualize this by animating it. We're going to use a MATLAB script to do so, and we're going to just pick some arbitrary angles, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 35 degrees, just to see what's happening. So we rotate about E3, and then about N hat, and finally about H hat, and get to our final reference frame. Here's a view of the completed rotation. We see that we have our original E1, E2, E3 directions and our new E, Q, H directions. The longitude of the ascending node tells us where in the E1, E2 plane the line of nodes is. The line of nodes is the line where the parafocal plane and the original E1, E2 plane cross. This argument is known as the longitude of the ascending node because by convention, we think of the orbiting body as going counterclockwise. And so this is where it rises above the E1, E2 plane, hence the ascending node. That means that the negative n hat direction is the descending node. The inclination tells us how much the specific angular momentum direction is offset from the original E3 direction. And the argument of periapsis tells us how much the E hat direction is offset from the line of nodes. And then you'll recall that nu measures the angle between the E hat direction, the eccentricity vector direction, or the periapsis direction, and the current orbital radius of the orbiting body. And note that omega and nu are measured in the same plane. However, 
capital omega and lowercase omega, in the case where i is non-zero, are measured in two different planes. The mathematical version of these statements is a set of matrix multiplications. You will recall that for subsequent rotations, we left multiply by each subsequent direction cosine matrix. So we start with a capital omega rotation about the third direction represented by this matrix, and then perform an I rotation about the first unit direction represented by this matrix. And finally, a lowercase omega rotation about the new third unit direction, which is this matrix. If we multiply all of this out, we get the full direction cosine matrix PCI, which represents the transformation of a vector's components in the I frame to that same vector's components in the P frame. Typically, we want the inverse rotation because we've already established the orbital radius and velocity components in the P frame. So what we're really looking for is ICP, which is the inverse or transpose of PCI. And so if we take the transpose of this matrix and multiply it by our parafocal frame components of the orbital radius vector using the polar coordinates r and nu, we will get the components of the orbital radius vector in our arbitrary I-frame, which is given by this expression. And there's 100% no reason why anybody should ever have to memorize any of this, because it is very, very easy to set up from first principles. Anytime you need this, you can just set up the matrix multiplication, have your computer crunch it, and get this result. Alternatively, you can just code this equation once and then never return to it again. There are some interesting special cases to consider. We noted that lowercase omega and capital omega were measured in two different planes, making omega plus capital omega a compound angle in cases where the inclination is non-zero. However, if the inclination is zero, we get a degeneracy. The intermediate rotation of this Euler angle set becomes the identity matrix. And so what you get is a net total rotation of just capital omega plus lowercase omega. There's no distinction between the two angles. And so in those cases, it is useful to define the longitude of periapsis, which is given by pi or this symbol var pi. You can still define the longitude of periapsis in cases where the inclination is non-zero, but in that case, it is explicitly a compound angle and not a regular planar angle. In instances where the eccentricity is zero, the periapsis direction is not well defined. And that means that there's no clear distinction between lowercase omega and nu, which are always measured in that same parafocal plane. And so here it is useful to define an argument of latitude, which is given by u or theta. You can always define the argument of latitude as a regular angle, and we will be using this quite frequently, even in cases where the eccentricity is non-zero. And in cases where both of these conditions hold, you can just add all three angles together because they will all be measured in the same plane and there will be no real distinction between them and define the true longitude, which is typically given by a lowercase l. And that is var pi plus nu or the sum of all three of these angles.